or far, wherever you may travel, whether upon the earth, through the skies, or over the seas, you will find creatures of strange forms and abilities, some so small that they are never seen, only felt. Some fly for years at a time without touching the ground, some breathe water or hear the future in the motion of the earth. So in the heavens, too, are beasts of many different kinds. These are four creatures of mystical attributes that roam the skies and wild lands, heralds of luck, sought by kings and the wise and upright. May knowledge of them prepare you for what tidings and blessings follow in their wake, should you be fortunate enough to see one. One quick note before we get any further. We're talking Chinese mythology here, and there are actually five beasts of good fortune. But there was simply too much about one of them in particular, so this time I've left out the dragon. We'll cover him in a future episode of All His Own. And with that, I invite you to join me, Jer Christie, as I look at the hidden legends that shape the world on The Mythographist. Season 1, The Myths of Mainland China. The Beasts of Good Fortune. The Qilin. When the Qilin touches the earth, the grass does not bend under the weight of its hooves. Rather than darkness, the shadow it casts is flame. It is foremost among the beasts of good fortune, the most powerful even in its gentleness, and the most majestic. Larger than the largest horse, the Qilin resembles a buck deer wreathed in fire, long-legged with great antlers upon its head. Its scales, for it has no fur, may be one of many colors, such as gold, green, purple, and qing, the color of new life, like azure or turquoise mixed with the finest green of a young flower. Even Yu Huang Dadi himself recognizes the Qilin as a bringer of fu, good fortune, and glad tidings. Long, long ago, we are told, a Qilin appeared to a pregnant woman and presented to her a jade tablet inscribed with a prophecy that her son's life would be most auspicious. And indeed, the child she bore was Kongzi, who is now known in all the world as Confucius. Thus, it is said that a Qilin's appearance heralds the arrival of a person of unusual wisdom and renown, and since ancient times, emperors watch and hope for one to pass through the kingdom during their reign. The Qilin has been getting a fair amount of media attention these days, being recently featured in Marvel's Shang-Chi, as well as the latest Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. They also show up in a number of video games and card games, sometimes with the name Chinese Unicorn, and they're sometimes conflated with a different creature, the Xie Zhi, who we're not going to talk about today. Here's some interesting trivia about our friend the Qilin. In Mandarin, each spoken syllable gets one written character, and most written characters have a number of meanings, particularly in combination with other words. However, the two characters that make up the word Qilin are unique to this creature, with the Qi being the male of the species and the Lin referring to the female. The story about Confucius' mother is likely the first Qilin legend, and it's recorded in the Zhuozhuan, which was written at some point between 700 and 500 BCE. The last purported Qilin sighting happened in 1414, when Ming emissaries brought back a pair of creatures with unbelievably long legs, scale-like fur covering an ox-like body, two weird little horns, hooves, the whole deal. Of course, these weren't Qilin. They were giraffes. These days, sculptures of Qilin can be observed guarding homes, usually one to either side of the door. They're carved from fine stone or cast from strong metal to echo the greatness of this wise and mighty beast. And this isn't just in China. Analogues of the Qilin can be found all over Asia, including Japan's Kirin, Thailand's Gailan, and Vietnam's Kai Lan. And in Korea, Kirin is the word not for a mythical beast, but for a quote-unquote normal animal. You guessed it, the giraffe. The Feng Huang. Upon the terraces of the mystical mountaintop of Kunlun lives the legendary bird Feng Huang, symbol of feminine strength and beauty. She is covered in feathers of five colors, red, yellow, black, white, and qing, 
and can grow bigger than a large dog. She is known to appear at the coming of a great person or event, and the sight of her never fails to bring celebration. The Fenghuang is a bird of great intelligence and discernment, and although she cannot be tamed or kept, that person who has a just and pure heart may befriend her. The Fenghuang is most often spotted in wild places. Many are known to make their home with Xi Wang Mu in her court on Kunlun Mountain, the bridge between the heavens and the earth. Here, it is recorded, the Fenghuang adorns herself with living snakes as she passes among the peach trees. The Fenghuang lived on the earth before the gods descended from the heavens, and forever she has been regarded by man and immortal alike as mystical. Unlike many birds, Fenghuang mate for life, and though they may travel far and wide throughout their long lives, they make their nest in only one place. Many are the tales which tell of the call and dance of the Fenghuang, most often in times of happiness. Her song is unlike that of any other bird. It uses five notes, even and pleasing to the ear. It is said that long ago, Ling Lun, Huang Di's minister of music, heard the song of the Fenghuang and was entranced. When he drilled holes into a bamboo shoot and created the first flute, its notes reflected hers, and so it was that music from ancient times has used the Fenghuang scale, beautiful in its simplicity. As the dragon is yang, male, the aspect of the sun, so the Fenghuang is yin, the female, the aspect of the moon. Such is their paradox. By their nature, only together are they truly complete and perfect. Yet, also by their natures, so opposite they are, that never can they truly be together. So it is that dragon and Fenghuang are destined to forever pursue each other, creating the balance they seek by never attaining it. The Fenghuang, as far as I can tell, is a bird unique to Chinese mythology. Despite this, besides Anne Burrell's translation of Shanghai Jing, which simply names her Bird of Five Colors, Fenghuang is almost universally translated into English, both by English and Chinese speakers, as Phoenix. And it's most definitely not a phoenix, as it has no fire, no rebirth, no real similarities at all in any Chinese source I can find. It seems that the translators in the late 1800s and early 1900s just heard Magical Bird and said, oh, I know that one, and we've been stuck with the association ever since. So when you hear somebody talking about the phoenix in Chinese mythology, they're actually talking about the Fenghuang. Yin and Yang is the balance of opposites, the black and the white, the dragon and the Fenghuang, and another part of this relationship, just like the dragon is the symbol of the emperor, the Fenghuang is the symbol of the empress, whether as the ruler or as the emperor's wife. The Fenghuang is also a frequent motif for female strength and elegance. However, like the Qilin, the name itself comes from the male, Feng, and the female, Huang, of the species. Also like the Qilin, these characters are unique, being used exclusively for this bird. I personally think that the Fenghuang is based on sightings of an actual bird. Pheasants in Asia are pretty wild in general, and specifically the Lady Amherst's pheasant and the Golden Pheasant, both native to parts of modern-day China, share many visual traits with the Fenghuang. As a final note, no pun intended, the music said to be inspired by the Fenghuang song is the five-note, or pentatonic scale. This mode is what makes music quote-unquote sound Asian, and while it's fundamentally based on the same mathematical intervals as those used in Western music, it uses the opposite nodes, as it were. Simply put, it mainly uses the black keys on the piano instead of the white ones. The Gui. Though many magical creatures seem strange to our eyes, there is one who is not so unfamiliar. The Gui, a symbol of longevity and protection, holds the wisdom of the future within his shell. He has a place in the northern sky, and his life is longer than even the oldest elder. Indeed, the turtle that paddles around our lakes and rivers is a humble likeness of the Gui, the mystical turtle of the heavens. The Gui is often black in color, though not always so, and he is said to lengthen the life of those he blesses. 
He is not quite so fantastical as a dragon or feng huang, but he is no less honorable, and the long years he has lived give him extraordinary wisdom. This wisdom and long sight he has passed on to the turtles of the earth, even in their death. This is why, when casting oracle bones to read the signs and omens of the future, the shamans of old would use a turtle's shell. Neither is the Gui a stranger to the great workings of history, for long, long ago, when Niuwa sought to right the tilting skies, it was a Gui from which she took two great legs, which then she used to prop up the heavens again. And there are some who say that it is a Gui who holds up the whole earth. On his broad shell, all the lands are carried safely wherever he may roam. There is so little to say about the Gui, who is also known as Lao Gui, Old Turtle, and Ling Gui, Spirit Turtle, but whose name is really literally just Turtle. And when it comes down to it, he is basically a magic turtle. You may have seen him in Kung Fu Panda, or maybe Gamera, depending on your point of view. He sees a lot of mentions overall, but usually it's as a talisman or a symbol, rather than an actual character. He's also a constellation in the northern sky, but again, no real story there. Some sources say that an ordinary turtle turns into a guay when it hits varying quantities of hundreds of years old. And turtle shells were used as oracles, as part of the first writing system in the lands that would one day become China. But that's about all I could find for the Gui. The Pishu. The Pishu is a beast of ferocious battle prowess. It patrols the skies, walking the heavens and warding off demons and evil spirits. It has a broad chest and four short legs, and its claws and fangs are sharper than the sharpest sword. Its tail is wide like a peacock's, and two small and feathered wings adorn its squat body. From the top of its head to the base of its neck run two ridges of sharp bone. The female Pishu, called Bixie, has two antlers upon her head, while the male, called Tianlu, has only one. The Pishu is renowned as a guardian, and it both keeps away enemies and keeps watch over its master's wealth. It guards gold and silver, jewels and treasures in a most peculiar way, and this is that it eats them for safekeeping. In fact, the Pishu has no other food. How does it keep these treasures safe once it has eaten them? If its master has need, the Pishu will vomit up its treasures, and this is for a simple reason. It has no hole from which to poop them out. So unnatural this is, how did it happen? Long, long ago, the Pishu was a pet of Yu Huang Da Di, the Jade Emperor of Heaven, and it lived in the Heavenly Palace. But one day, the Pishu pooped upon the royal floor and left its mess for all to see. When Yu Di found out, so fierce was his anger that he rolled up the previous day's newspaper and walloped the Pishu's posterior. And so hard did he spank the Pishu that the poor creature's anus disappeared completely never to return. Seeing this as a useful trait, Yu Di charged it with keeping safe many treasures, for who would think to look in the belly of such a beast? Because of both its ferocity and its ability to keep treasures so safe, the Pishu is a welcomed guest in any household, despite its history of poor manners indoors. Many places of business keep a stone Pishu perched atop their front desk or posted in pairs before their door. If you should see a Pishu yourself, take note of its belly. The bigger and rounder it is, the more wealth the Pishu holds, patiently waiting for its master's word to divulge the riches within. I swear I did not make this story up. The Pishu is possibly my favorite story in all of Chinese mythology. When I started this project a few weeks into my research, I was beginning to worry that there wouldn't be as much interesting material as I had first suspected. Needless to say, though, I realized that this doubt was completely unfounded when I heard the Pishu's tale. As noted, stone Pishus are often used as outer door guards in modern China, though less frequently than Chilians and lions. They are also seen on counters in restaurants and other businesses, and bear a passing resemblance to the Western dragon. As with any other list in Chinese mythology, there are many variations of which beasts get included here. 
A list that complements this one is the Four Wicked Creatures, the Taowu, the Hundun, the Taotie, and the Chongqi, which is also sometimes juxtaposed against the Four Noble Creatures, the Gui, the Dragon, the Tiger, and the Vermilion Bird, which are also major constellations. I'll cover each of these lists in a future episode. Most Chinese people know most of these creatures. Everyone and their grandmother knows the Gui and the Fenghuang, and a fair amount know the Qilin. Well, at least in my experience, fewer know the Pishu, often confusing it for a Qilin. All four can frequently be found as motifs in art, particularly paintings and stone sculptures. But let's talk about the burning question we're all thinking about, which of these would make the best pet? Well, just for you, I undertook extensive research and analysis considering factors like size, behavior, temperament, habitat, household uses, practicality, exercise needs, potential for property damage. At the end, I am happy to recommend, for your consideration as a pet, the Pishu. Fairly small, doesn't need to be housebroken since it's literally incapable of making a mess, a fierce and loyal protector, and practical for storing valuables, if you have the chance to welcome a Pishu into your life, I highly recommend it. It'll keep your valuables safe inside its belly. Just don't tell it that your family is your greatest treasure. If you have personal experience with any of these creatures, please share. I'd love to hear any first-hand accounts that you may have. Because remember, we can't learn if we don't listen, and I think we would all love to learn more about these fortunate beasts. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Mythographist. This episode was written, narrated, and produced by me, Jer Christie, with research by myself and Elena Tung, and music by Xiaoqing Luna Li. If you enjoyed the episode, we'd love to hear about it. Like it, comment on it, tell a friend about it. Finally, if you have a story from your culture that you'd like to share, especially one that's shaped the way you see the world, get in touch. There are so many stories in the world, and the more of them we hear, the more we'll understand each other. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time on The Mythographist.